So, good morning, everybody. My name is Philippa Menzel. Um, I am the Secretary of the Canny Europe Chapter, and it is my pleasure to welcome you this morning to this special um, March monthly meeting, which is taking place uh, within the framework of Canny Climate Action Week 2024. Um, and so I hope that you've had the opportunity to take part in some of the other events that have been taking place this week. There's been lots on the agenda, and if not, don't worry, they've all been uh, recorded. Um, and today we have a fantastic uh, agenda for you also. I'm just going to pop the link to the meeting agenda in the chat so that you can follow along. Um, so as you can see, we have a wonderful speaker for you this morning, Matt Tips, Policy Advisor from KU. Levin, and I know that's uh, one of the reasons many of you are joining this morning. Uh, so we're really looking forward to, to that presentation. Um, but uh, we also have a couple of other things on the agenda. We're going to start out as we have, thankfully, some, some new faces um, and names that I can see on the uh, attendees. So welcome everybody. And we will be doing a little introduction to CANI and specifically to the CANI Europe chapter. Um, so that if you are new to us, you can uh, see what we're about, and our president Margarita will be will be doing that part. Um, as I said, we have a wonderful presentation from Matt. Before we get into that as well, we will also do a little introduction to the uh, the Canny Accord because we couldn't talk about um, staff travel uh, without showing you the Canny Accord and how that can shape your policy making in that area, and also, of course, in many other areas. So our Canny Europe Accord leader Maria is going to do a little introduction to that too. Um, and then this will be an interactive session. So later on in the meeting, you will have the chance to go into breakout rooms to do some discussion um, about the about Matt's presentation and about staff travel policy in general. So um, before we dig into all of that, a quick but uh, heartfelt thank you to our sponsors of Climate Action Week 2024. First of all, we have the University of Tasmania. Um, a huge supporter of, of Canny um, and very uh, active when it comes to, to sustainability. And I'm just going to show a very quick uh, video from them about their sustainability policy. If I can get it to start, here we go. I don't think it's starting, Philippa. It doesn't seem to be starting yet. Right, just one second, see if I can launch it again. Otherwise, I'll pop the link in the, in the chat to you later so you can watch it. But... Uh, you can see the, the the first image, but obviously it's not it's not playing. It's not starting, yeah. Inevitably, Sorry. inevitably yeah. it would have come to work when you needed to. But yeah, I'll pop it in the chat later, and you can have a look at uh, at what the University of Tasmania are doing in terms of sustainability. And then a second thank you to our second sponsor, Alethea Global. Um, Alethea Global is a worker cooperative and sustainability training consultancy built by members with relevant international education experience and knowledge to support the required transformation for a more equitable, climate conscious and sustainable sector. Um, and you can see on the screen a quick word from CJ Tremblay, founding and managing director of Alethea Global, who um, is also very involved in, in CANI and understands as well as anybody the uh, critical role that CANI plays in advancing the awareness of climate action in the international education community. So a big thank you to both of those sponsors. If you would like to support CANI, um, then as you can see, we are proudly grassroots volunteer led and run and Margarita will tell you a bit more about that in the moment, but like any um, organization, we face ongoing costs. Uh, so if you would like to support us in continuing um, the work that we are doing, you can see the link on the screen and there is the option to do a one-time donation if you would like, or you can even set up a, a monthly donation plan. So we would appreciate any help 
um, in the form of donation that you would be willing to offer us. And with that, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to our president, Margarita, to do the introduction to Canny and Canny Europe. Thanks, Margarita. Thanks, Felipa. Um, so good morning, everyone. My name is Margarita Pasquini, and I am very excited to be online with you all this morning. It's uh, um, as you know, our leadership team is the first time that Daniel, Felipa, and I are, um, you know, um, are uh, you know in this in this role for the first time in a climate action week. So that's pretty that's pretty exciting. It's our first climate action week as uh, you know, uh, president, vice president, secretary of Europe chapter. <clears throat> so if you uh, haven't been involved in CANI or if you don't know much about it. Um, CANI stands for Climate Action Network International Educators and was funded in 2019 um, as kind of a response to the uh, urgent need for climate action in our field, uh, kind of recognizing it and acknowledging that uh, what we do is amazing, is great, but also has a very heavy impact on the environment. And so, um, we would like to um, think about our field as a sustainable one, not just now, but in the future. So um, trying to reduce the emissions and if not get into zero emissions by 2030, at least to kind of rethink what we do in terms of like making more, you know, less heavy on the, on the planet. Um, and so we, this is an advocacy group and an action group. So we, what we try to do is advocate, educate, and act. Those are the kind of three pillars that we have for Kani. So advocate for a more, um, you know, sustainable industry and for more, um, you know, climate action in our field. Um, educate around this topic because obviously we want people to know, and it seems like there's still a lot to work, a lot of work to be done. Because uh, even if we are educators and our field is really sensitive to like a lot of like social causes, causes and a lot of like, um, you know, social justice, and um, we still need to understand and and kind of, um, yeah, kind of understand what our role is in the climate crisis that we are contributing to. So, and then obviously act. We don't want just to understand. We don't want just to acknowledge. And we don't, we don't want just to admit that there is an impact, but we want to act on it. So we want to understand and act. So we can move on, I think, to the next slide. So we are now five years old. So uh, <laughs> so it's a good age, right? Um, so uh, we, this is some awards that we have been awarded. Sorry, pardon the pun, but... So the pioneers, the, the year finalists, 2021, the AA President Award 2022, and the Distinguished Contribution to International Education in Australia at IAC 2023, <clears throat> awarded to our um, founder, uh, El Salomon. So for now, we have um, around 750 institutions, like uh, practitioners from different institutions uh, who have signed up either, you know, to be part of CANI or just to, you know, get some uh, news about us and being updated. So that's our kind of network. And when it comes to the Kani Accord, so far we have, um, I think it's like even more than 65, so it's great, um, Kani Accord signatories, including NAPSA, EIE, and University of 21. If you don't know what the Kani Accord is, uh, Maria, uh, she will talk about a little bit more uh, later in the presentation today. So, so you can familiarize yourself with the Kani Accord, which is one of the major initiatives that we have as um, Kani. So we really hope that we, uh, as, Danny comment, as Daniel commented in the chat, uh, we are seeing new faces online, which is great. So if you haven't signed up to our newsletter, if you want to be part of the network, please join Kani. Um, you can join Kani in different, a different, in different capacities. So we have a core group of very active members. So if you're not a part of that, that's amazing. That's great. We need more volunteers. If you can't take, you know, if you can dedicate a lot of time to that, but you just want to be, you know, up to date with the initiatives they want to support us with you know with just like advocating your own, your own institution that's also fine um just make sure that you sign up so that we can um so we can send you um our information and also invite to our monthly meetings because we meet once a month and i think we can talk about it now that we talk about the europe chapter structure so Kani is divided in three main chapters for now we're looking at including one more chapter but for now it's like america's Europe and Oceania. And so obviously, as the 2024 academic year started, we um, decided to kind of set our goals and, and, and objective for this year. And our strategic priorities that we want to share with you are member engagement, 
we want you to really feel part of the community um sharing knowledge and best practice we we really would like to you know as we're doing today with Matt sharing their like their best practice I think it's important that we share what's already out there and um what we can um what we can learn from each other because it's an important so we don't reinvent the wheel every time and then the, the kind of core promotion it's also a crucial part of what we want to get out of this year together so far we have 350 plus European members which is like a good number I want to say and um, we meet once a month uh, for 60 minutes. Um, generally, it's Friday morning. It's going to be like Thursday afternoon for a while, I guess, uh, in the upcoming month. Um, and the goal is to share, but also to feel supported because we all know that climate action and you know advocacy for climate action can make you feel lonely. <laughs> so we need support, we need a group, and we need to be able to talk to like-minded people. And so um, we also have a Padlet that I think Daniel's just shared in the chat. Um, so you can see who's already part of the group. It's not a complete list, but if you want to, you know, create your own profile um, just to kind of like be there, um, that's, uh, that's great. And then we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and then so if you want to be like... If you want to get engaged with uh, with the group, we have global working groups and European subgroups. Obviously, our groups kind of align to the global um, strategy and priorities. Um, so the global working groups are the Academic Advisory Board, the Revenue Generation, Climate Justice, Accord Accelerator, Podcast, Climate Action Week, and Social Media. So if you feel you would like to, you know, any of these areas are your interest, you can reach out to us and we'll kind of redirect you to uh, the right contact person for each group. And then we also have the European subgroups. Um, and I believe that the groups lead, the group leaders are here. So the Bremer engagement and uh, uh, is B. I think B is online uh, with us today, I believe. The Kanye core promotion is going to be Maria and the chapter communication and operation is Philippa, our secretary. Um, so if you feel you want to contribute, and you have some time and capacity, just reach out to us and we will, hi B, thank you. Um, so we will um, we'll be able to like redirect you to the right contact person and we can take it from there. Even if you would like to do something, but not sure, that is also like, we're happy to work with you to kind of define, because like it can be a lot of information. So you might not be sure where to start and how you can contribute. And uh, if you don't have a scientific background or if you don't think you know absolutely anything about this topic, but you want to dedicate time, please just reach out. <laughs> so yeah, that's it, I guess, right? Absolutely, thank you, Margarita. Um, so yes, I will reiterate that. Please reach out, don't hesitate to, to reach out to us if you, even just for the small list of uh, contributions or um, the tasks that you could potentially see yourself doing for Kenny. Um, as I mentioned, before we jump into our presentation from Matt, uh, we will hand over to Maria, who is going to give us an introduction to the Kenny Accord and how that can help you shaping your policy making in this area. Every Thank, team you, Philippa. Thank you, Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, great to see you all here. Uh, just a quick word on uh, the Kenya Accord. Um, uh, the Kenya Accord uh, is a public commitment and a set of practical actions. It's been developed and uh, launched in 2022 um, to guide and support um, international education sector in um, its response to a climate crisis. So that's um, something um, that can help you um, shape up your policy or guide your institution um, on the way to carbon emission, um, carbon emission journey. And on the next slide, we can see um, an overview of what um, what is in the Kenya Accord uh, paper. You can see that uh, first three articles are uh, giving you um, a context of um, of the paper of uh, what uh, what uh, it contains. And it's very user friendly because it's um, each um, uh, it, it has seventy actions um, that are divided between uh, five areas. Um, 
including leadership and influencing, travel, climate education, facilities and operations, emissions accounting. And uh, each of them um, includes three categories, basic, better and best. So it, and depending on where your institution is in, in their journey, um, uh to respond to climate crisis uh, you can choose either from the basic better or the best and you can then increase it uh, accordingly when you accomplish uh, each of these actions so in order to uh, become a signatory you would need to um, uh, sign up for at least five um, actions out of 70 uh, across at least three of the areas that you can see on your screen. Um, some of the actions, uh, for example, when it comes to travel um, or staff mobility, that uh, we will hear more from Matt today, uh, would sound like uh, locate staff offshore and adjust business models to reduce the need for air travel, something like that, uh, virtual exchanges when it comes to student mobility. Um, the process for signatories uh, is on the next slide and um, it's quite straightforward. Um, you can um, submit your application on kenny.org um, and choose the actions you would like to commit to. Uh, we will receive um, your application, uh, review it and uh, we'll share with you a draft uh, of your commitments uh, for you to check and confirm that everything is correct. After that, we will post it um, on Kenya website um, with information about your institution as a proud signatory of Kenya Court. Uh, and if you have any questions at any um, stage of the process, you can reach out uh, to me or Kenya Accord Group uh, at Kenya at Accord.org and uh, we can have a meeting, discuss the process and um, any concerns or questions you might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, so without further ado, we're going to move on to our presentation this morning. Um, Matt, I think you're going to share your slides yourself. So while you're setting that up, I will give you a little introduction. Um, so Matt Tips has been working at KU Levin since 2008. Um, he's currently policy advisor at the sustainability office of KU Levin, as well as in the international team of the faculty of bioscience engineering. Um, he's the former IROCA president and is still active in the um, executive committee as sustainability officer. And besides all of that, he is a very active member of the Canny Europe chapter uh, and a key contributor, for example, to uh, our hashtag travel with Canny campaign around the EIE um, and in general, yes, volunteers and helps out with, with Canny a lot. So um, over to you, Matt. Good morning. I'm just, Philippe and I have been checking everything several times and then it's still. <laughs> so yeah. I hope you can see my screen now well. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Philippa, uh, for the introduction and thank you, everybody, for joining and the Can Europe chapter for giving me the opportunity to share a practice at K. Leuven. Um, this is what has been said by Margarita as well. What Kenny also saw is about is like to share good practices and, and to learn from each other. We always don't need to invent new things so we can maybe really share things and then increase your own policies at your own universities. And I think uh, Margarita posted this morning on LinkedIn as well that this is a really a good group of friends really trying to move it in a good way. So uh, please join, it would be very, very nice. Uh, we cannot do this alone. So what I will present today is the the sustainable travel policy we have in place for K. Leuven. Um, and afterwards, um, there will be some more discussions in smaller groups where we can learn more from each other. So this is just like an example uh, from one university. So um, at K. Leuven, we have um, a travel policy in place, but it doesn't come from nowhere. Um, so already in 2016 and before we had some bottom up initiatives. So we had the different faculties, research groups that were trying to put some travel policies in place. 
very bottom up who they started at different faculties so but it was not overarching the whole university in 2017 the young researchers the phd students and the researchers they wrote an open letter to the university management and they made a very concrete policy proposal like hey maybe we need to move forward something also in our business operations and uh, business travel and they made a very concrete uh, initiative and then this led in 2018 to a very concrete sustainable travel policy for the whole of the university. So it was really, it really came bottom up. And then the management was also on board. We had a new uh, government at the university. We had much focus on sustainability. We had a roadmap for the university. And then, of course, business operations is there. So it was really bottom up, top down, and we met somewhere in the middle. And the sustainable travel policy was put in place uh, now six years ago. At that time, um, we focused a lot of um, flight compensation. So of course, all these flights taking place from the staff, uh, we were trying to compensate it, but at that time it was still voluntary. So we had a travel policy and compensation was voluntary. But the vice director for sustainable policy and the president of the sustainability council then went to speak with all the, uh, the faculties and they presented again and there was actually no objection anymore to these flight compensation. So in 2020, we made a small update and at that time the flight compensation was generalized. So all staff travels were compensated at that time. So that was in 2020. So um, over the years, what, what was has been the effect? Of course, there was COVID in between, but if we just look like just the academic year before COVID, uh, we had an emissions of over 7,500 tons of carbon emissions related to staff travels. And if you just look to the last academic year, post COVID, um, then we, we dropped around 10%. We dropped 750 tons of carbon emissions. So which is really very good for our roadmap, very important. Of course, is this completely related to the business travel policy or post-COVID, more and more people are used to video conferencing. It's very difficult to pinpoint. The effect is there anyhow, and we hope to decrease these emissions. So 2020, we had the update. And then last year, we wanted to start working on a new update. Why was this urgency there? We have the ETS system, you know, the system of credits that's related to high carbon emissions for industry. And at that time, when it was introduced, the flight industry was not included in it. But we know that from this year, next year, and then in 2026, the flight industry will be completed integrated in the ETS system. So therefore, we felt like, hey, is our compensation policy still in line with the ETS system from the European Commission? Then, of course, we are university. There is a lot of research going on all over the world. And of course, there was there are a lot of high new insights on the effects of the emissions from, uh, from flight. So it's not only carbon anymore. We have a lot of other effects. So of course, we want to include this as well. We also feel that as a university, yeah, we feel that we need to take up some leadership. Um, for our students, uh, we cannot, we have a green Erasmus policy in place as well, but it's very strange to ask our students to think about it and then do business as usual, but also for society. Um, we've seen also in COVID, a lot of people look to the universities with all the academic knowledge, with the research. And then of course, I think also for society, we need to take up this leadership. If we are not going to take the lead, who is going to do it? So I think that's an important role as well. Then, of course, the European Commission, the von der Leyen Commission, introduced the Green Deal uh, with a lot of effects going all over, also in the mobility sector. So where is the more uh, attention going on to uh, sustainable mobility, as well as in the Erasmus program with the Green Erasmus project? So you really see that also on the high level, a lot of things are changing. K. Leuven also joined the Business Travel Pioneers. It's a Belgium initiative and uh, other universities and businesses joined the coalition that, okay, we need to change our business travel policies. So after joining that, we felt that, okay, yeah, we cannot just join to be on the list. We really need to put this in uh, practice as well. And then, as I mentioned, we have this compensation of flights. And then at that time, it was... Uh, decided what to do with these funds. And then, of course, we, we felt that, okay, maybe we need to review this as well. So all this led that, okay, we need to make an update. So in the new policy, which has been approved by the Academic Council um, earlier this year, 
um, we will focus on three main pillars. And actually, why why are they there? Because actually, we just want to reduce the carbon emissions and all the other effects related to business travels. As I mentioned, we have a roadmap. Uh, we have a lot of in information about the business operations. And then mobility, community in Belgium is part of it, but also the international travels. We also would like to create awareness amongst the big K living community. You need to know that we are responsible for 20,000 staff members. So we are quite a big company uh, as well. So the new policy will focus on avoid shift compensate. And really, while maybe the previous uh, policy was focusing a lot of the compensate, the new policy really focus on avoid business travels and shift to more sustainable means. But everywhere in the communication, these three things are there, starting with avoid, moving to shift, and then compensate if a flight still need to take place. Because of course, with this policy, we don't want to forbid international travel. We really want to be an inclusive university. We want to be an international university. We see all the added values, but it's just to rethink the way we are doing. Like, of course, we, we have a lot of international projects and we want to continue these projects, but maybe you don't need to meet your partners in, let's just say, uh, Australia try twice a year. Maybe you can go once per year or once every two years. Um, there are studies that your academic output is not related to the number of flights you are taking. So it's just to, to make a mental shift. It's not at all to uh, stop with international cooperation. Let's be clear on that. It's just the way we do this. So first of all, okay, avoid. And I think, of course, COVID helped in this life rethinking that do you really always need to go abroad um, and that's we want to make a, a mind shift uh, there as well and in the policy we indicate okay you cannot have an international travel for a one-on-one -on -one meeting so that's not allowed anymore and you can also not travel abroad for meetings less than four hours so that's really now in the policy. Again, we want to create a shift there. Maybe somebody would travel just for a three hours meeting. Then, hey, the policy says that I cannot do this, but maybe I can stay two days and maybe I can combine it with see some other professors or give, give a lecture there. So really, again, try to change uh, mental uh, shift there as well. So what is recommended as well for uh, professors and staff traveling intercontinental, that a stay of minimum five days is recommended. Of course, there is a jet lag, it's also mental health, but also once you are there, take most out of it, combine it with other activities while you are there. It is still possible to have a deviation for it if your direct supervisor allowed. Maybe you will need to buy a very, very expensive scientific instrument and you really want to see it and you need to travel because it's a 1 million euro investment. Okay, yeah, then maybe you can go for a one-on-one -on -one meeting, but then you will still need to ask the approval of your direct supervisor. So main part, avoid the international travels. And then the shift to uh, more sustainable modes. And what the policy says that, of course, I know in Belgium we are very blessed with a lot of high-speed connections from Brussels, but the policy says that um, if you can travel by train and you re can reach your destination within eight hours, then you need to take the train or a bus, but a sustainable travel mode. So this is really not part of the policy. It was also mentioned in the business travel pioneers. So that was really the line, the eight hours, and we included it there. So the map that you can see, it comes from a website that we are using for, um, for the, the calculation. So it's really very easy. It's like, okay, we leave from Brussels because Leuven, we have 13 campuses in 11 cities. So we, we start from Brussels, also Brussels airport, Brussels Midi, the main train station, they're all situated there. So we start calculating from there. The website is called Chrono Trains. Um, it's actually a French website. They work with data from Deutsche Bahn. But actually there you can see, you can put in any uh, train station and then you can see where do I get in five, six, seven, eight hours. So we took Brussels eight hours. We were in contact with the developer to make this map for us. So we we're very thankful for that. So this is the policy reachable in eight hours. You uh, can go by train. And as you can see on the map, you can get quite far in Europe in eight hours. So uh, we are very happy with that. Of course, we also know that traveling by train is not always 
as easy as it is by traveling by plane. So we would like to support our staff in, in planning everything. So first of all, we have a website. It's called Green Erasmus. It was initially a focus on students, but now we are shifting and making this website accessible for staff as well, just to help staff booking trains and bus travels in a more easy way. Um, we all know it's not always that easy, but on this website, we put a lot of information to make it more accessible. Then there is also the travel agency. We have a, a travel agent and all our staff travels are handled by this travel agency. And there, of course, there is a responsibility there as well that actually if a staff member would like to book a travel that's reachable in eight hours, then the travel agent can only offer train travels. So there we have the agreement with the travel agency as well. And then we are looking like, OK, can we give an allowance for increased cost and travel time? So that's being debated now as well. We have two exceptions as well, um, which are the transit cities. Um, you can take a, a very easy train to Paris and Amsterdam and then take an intercontinental flight. Unfortunately, it's not always like going to London or Frankfurt. I, we, we are still discussing also with the, the train and plane companies about that, but unfortunately, you cannot always book a train and a plane ticket at once. And then if your train is delayed, you might miss your intercontinental flight. So that's why for the time being, the transit cities are excluded from this list. Um, of course, there might be some deviations. Also, we would like to be socially inclusive as well. For example, if you need to go to the Seren in Geneva and on Friday you want to come back the last train is at 4 30 and your meet is until six but you want to be home for the weekend to see your kids and family then of course you can ask an exception as well so very uh, fair there as well but the normal rule is reachable in eight hours you take the train so this was the um, the avoid and the shift, and then we move to the compensate. Okay, we will still need to take flights, but then of course we would like to compensate. We would like to take these carbon emissions out of the air. Uh, we all know that it's not always um, very clear business, so we we all we are very aware. So that's why we are very careful how to proceed with this. So uh, I think more, a lot of slides in my presentations are on this. Um, on the Academic Council, the paper was 40 pages, and I think 20 pages was just on this compensation because we really wanted uh, to be very clear that it was scientifically based as well. Um, so for the calculator, we will use Green Tripper. Uh, we made an analysis of different calculators for carbon emissions available. We turned out with Green Tripper. Um, I can give more details uh, for the ones interested why we choose this one, uh, but we decided to go with Green Tripper. Before in the former um, policy, um, we just calculated the carbon emissions, but we all know that it's more than just carbon emissions. So flights do have much more effects than just putting carbon in the air. So therefore, we will start to use a multiplier um, for the radiative forcing index. So and there, so we will make, make a calculation of almost double the carbon emissions for the effects on the climate. We use the UK uh, DEFRA. They came up with the 1.9. So we're going to follow this. Again, in the note, we explained much more. Um, just to let you know that um, the radiative forcing index is, means that, okay, the damaging effects from flying and carbon from coming out of flight, it's much more than only carbon. You also have nitrogen emissions. You have these white clouds coming out of the planes. So you have a lot of uh, other effects. So this paper, I can only recommend, it's Lee et al. You can find it here. It's very recommended. It's very easy to read as well. And he really explains like, what are all these effects? So that's why, there is a scientific consensus on this, that indeed these flights have more effects than only carbon. So that's why we are uh, introducing this radiative forcing index. We used, as I mentioned, DEFRA, we're going to multiply 1.9. If you look at it from the same paper, these non-carbon uh, effects, actually 1.9 is still on the intermediate side. So actually, um, we could also use two, three, but we, we came up like, okay, we're going to follow DEFRA, but we really know that actually scientifically the effects are even uh, bigger. So then we have a, a new calculator. We are in introducing the radiative forcing index, and then it comes to pricing. Um, in the former uh, policy, we had uh, introduced a price of 40 carb, uh, euro per ton carbon emissions. You need to think at that time, um, it was in 2018, it was 
quite um, it was quite uh, progressive at that time. But of course, the ones that following is know that the price of uh, ETS pricing goes up. So there we said like we are not going to put just a number there. We are going to follow the real price of ETS um, for one reason or another. Or another, the last month the price has been dropping. We we don't know what's happening. Um, but normally last year the price was around 80, 90 euros. Um, in 2023. So we decide like, okay, in January, we're going to have a look to the official European ETS price, uh, the average for the year before, and that will be the, our price setting for the coming year. So, um, of course, at the, at the council, we came out like, okay, how are we going to introduce it? In 2024, it was decided we're just going to make an inflation correction uh, because we will introduce already the uh, radiative forcing index. So it will already be multiplied by two. So to make it immediately to a higher price, it's like, okay, let's go step by step. So in 24, the price setting will be 48, uh, almost 50 euro per ton of carbon emission. But from 25, we will follow the ETS pricing based on what the average price will be in 24. And as you can see in the remarks, at that time, we will still not make a differentiation between European and intercontinental flight. We will start doing this in 26 because in 26, uh, the airline industry will be included in ETS. And actually at that time, it's also expected that uh, flight tickets will get more expensive because um, the airline companies will not get free credits anymore. So then we said, okay, then we actually, we cannot like double count it. So it, it is already incalculated in the price setting of the companies. So that's why we say like, okay, this radiative forcing, we will only include it in the intercontinental flight because their ETS price is not included in the tickets. So the team really worked very much on this <laughs> uh, sign because it was very complicated, like, uh, we want to calculate it right, but we don't want to over calculate. So just to let you see, like up to 23, we were at K11, we were only taking the carbon emissions into account. So we didn't took any of these additional effects, the radiative forcing, we did not take that into account in the compensation. The next coming two years, we will include radiative forcing for both intercontinental flights and European flights. So we will use this multiplier 1.9, but from 26 onwards for intercontinent, intercontinental flights, we will include carbon and the radiative forcing index, but for the European flights, we will only ask a compensation fee for the radiative forcing index. So just to give you the different steps, how uh, we are proceeding. So just to give some uh, examples of price, what will this mean uh, for our staff when they travel and they take a flight and they flight and they need to compensate? So for example, uh, we have we took four destinations: Barcelona, New York, Beijing, and Sydney. You can see the carbon emissions there, and then the fee that we are asking now up till last year. So a Brussels Barcelona, it's a one way, it's not a return, so that was a sixteen euro, but it went up to one hundred forty five for Sydney. For 2026, I skip 24 and 25. You see for Brussels, Barcelona, the price will drop a little bit, but it is expected that the pricing will go up. Anyhow, the price tickets will go up because ETS will, the flight tickets will be included in ETS. But then you can see for the intercontinental flights, the compensation fee will go high, highly up. So uh, again, this is a fee that we will ask. It's also like, we have these emissions, we need to compensate, and maybe we can also like uh, make our professors and staff more responsible, like, hey, maybe I can take some less flights. Um, what we also did, which wasn't there yet in 23, is to make a differentiation on onboarding class. So we, uh, as you might know, business class and first class, they take a little more space in the airplane. So actually, it's normal that they should pay more because they take more space in the plane. So what we are going to do from 24 onwards is actually uh, use another multiplicator. So a business class tickets if for European flight, because there it's still limited, the difference will be a multiplier from 1.5, but for an intercontinental flight, it go up to three. For first class intercontinental, we will use a multiplier of four. So it's really, it has been decided. So at K11, uh, professors, uh, staff, if their research group is willingly to pay, they can 
take another, uh, they can take a business class, but the compensation fee will follow accordingly. And then a last thing about compensation is um, in the previous policy, any two will stay there, is that um, staff can still opt out. Like, okay, I follow the whole policy, but I don't want to pay the compensation fee. Um, so far, um, less than 2% of the staff opted out of the system. So that was one of the reasons like, okay, we're gonna include the whole avoid shift compensate, we're gonna implement it, it's gonna be obligatory. First steps, the avoid and the shift, but the compensate, we're gonna leave the opt out option there, but we're gonna make some changes. It needs to be individual. Uh, before professors could exclude their whole research team. So that's not possible anymore. Everybody that wants to opt out need to do personally. It's only valid for one year. So every year you should need to extend and you need to have like valid reasons. And for example, if a staff member say like, hey, I really need to fly, but uh, my research group, we don't have enough funding. Uh, I would like to be excluded for the compensation. So that might be a valid reason not to pay. Again, we don't, we want to be socially inclusive as well there. And my last two slides are, okay, what do we do then with uh, the money coming in? Uh, I know some universities use uh, compensation funds from the travel agency. We have our own K-11 climate fund. And in the previous uh, period, we defined four projects. So um, we had a reforestation project, uh, different projects. We were still working at that time with the verified emission reductions, but science has been showing that it's really also a bit of, might be a little bit of dodgy business, so we will exclude it uh, in the future. Video conferencing, take in mind it was pre-COVID, so if a research unit or faculty wanted to buy a video conferencing tool, we were giving some money, but now the whole of the university has enough video conferences and we were supporting some research. The good thing is that uh, at that time when we introduced it, we asked everybody, where do you want your money goes to? So again, which was very important to get everybody on board that at least they know that I, if I take a flight, then my money will go there. So you could see that most people have chosen the reforestation project. So that was there. So now I think the coming weeks it will be decided, okay, for the next turn, uh, where will the money go through? Um, and here are some ideas that are on the table. Uh, we will probably continue with some reforestation projects in the global south. Again, global uh, climate justice. Um, I think they feel, I know they feel much more the effects of the climate crisis, the one that we caused. So that's why we would like to do, mainly do it, the compensation there. We are considering like of a bit of a positive nudging, like to compensate maybe uh, some train tickets. So we are still thinking like maybe we give some extra money if your train is more than five, six, seven, eight hours, or we might consider like if you book your train ticket and it's more complex and the travel agents ask some uh, handling fee that we take the handling fee just with the idea of like, we take care of you. We know that we oblige you to take the train. We know it's not easy, book it take it out of hand and we will pay for the fee. So we really would like to get everybody on board. We are thinking about maybe to include some sustainable projects uh, at K Leuven, really only the ones that have a carbon uh, reduction uh, profile as well for research, but there we are still uh, topping up. And then of course, we're gonna focus much more on the awareness raising about avoid and, and shift. So, but this will be on the table soon. And then again, we're gonna ask everybody where the money needs to go through again to get everybody on board. So this was my last slide, and you can always ask questions to me and also my uh, colleague, Annelies, who has been working much as well for the to get this paper on the desk of the Academic Council. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, I think we're all just in awe of how comprehensive and well thought out and, as Daniel said in the chat, supportive this policy is. So congratulations. First of all, that's what I would like to say. There are a couple of uh, questions that came up in the chat, um, which I think we have time for. We are a little bit behind, but I would still like us to have time for the breakout rooms, but I think it's important that people have the option to ask you a question. The first one that came in was, how do you check if uh, this policy is being implemented? So no one-on-one -on -one meetings, no meetings of less than four hours. How, how are you checking? Are you 
Um, so yeah, every scout member at K11, so uh, when they travel abroad, they need to make uh, an online application. Um, and there, of course, we will see like um, if it's less than one day that they make the application, then the, the system will make a top up, a pop up like, hey, this is not according to the policy. And then if you still would like to proceed, then your direct supervisor will get a note like, hey, this person of your team would like to travel abroad and he, she, they are requesting a, an exception from the policy. So, but I need to admit, we are still working on that IT. Uh, we are actually very happy that the academic council approved the policy that quick. And actually we were caught by the quickness. So we are really now putting everything in place, the IT systems, uh, the, the travel agency. So we are really uh, catching up there, but we hope by May, June that everything will be ready. Great, thank you. And then I see another question in the chat from John. Um, great policy and presentation. We can reduce and reduce, of course, but how realistic is net zero by 2030? Will this need to depend on carbon capture? I think... Uh... <laughs> I think we can have another uh, presentation on, on on this, like the, the emissions thing, the compensation and, and the reduction. Uh, our, our idea is like, okay, we, we really would like to focus on the avoid and the shift. Really, that's the most important. But then we still know that, okay, there will still be some emissions and these one we would like to, to compensate uh, with carbon capture, with reforestation, with all different means. Uh, but of course, I agree completely that we need to focus on the avoid and the shift. Okay. There are, I see there's some more questions coming in. I think we can take maybe two of them and then we'll move straight away to the breakout rooms. But um, important question that I think a lot of us had, what was the feedback of the colleagues once you implemented this policy? Did you receive resistance? So the good thing is that what was important as well, of course, is that we um, we did it gradually. That's why I also showed a little bit the timeline to get everybody on board that we really started like, okay, a policy plan with voluntary compensation, a policy plan with, um, with a generalized compensation, and now we scale up again. Um, so um, we know that now... The, the good thing is the management is there. So the director, the vice directors, the deans, they really very quickly approved, they agreed, uh, so which is very nice to have this um, management support. And I think it's crucial there as well. Um, the policy was also put in place with support from the international office, which was also important. And now we are implementing. And indeed, I agree, we do get a lot of questions about it. Um, a lot of people are a little bit afraid what is going to happen. So we we, we hope that the opt-outs are not going to increase too much. Um, but uh, we will work on a communication campaign, an awareness campaign. Uh, so the moment everything is put in place, everybody will get an email from the vice director directly. Uh, it's planned for May, June, uh, explaining everything once more. So, And we know that um, the rest of the year we will work on communication and awareness raising. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> I think we can take one more question. Um, I mean, we're yeah, we're tight on the on the timing, so I want to be mindful of everybody's time. I think it would be still be lovely if people have time that we do launch the breakout rooms, but maybe we'll do that just once we've answered this question because there's so much great conversation coming in. Matt, maybe it would be nice if you could um, stop your slide sharing so we can see people's faces as well. I think that would um, lovely. Yes, because we have got lots of people here asking some. Wonderful questions. I had one from, come through from Sarah. How do you handle flights for research that is funded through EU grants and some sort of external funder that does not approve costs for offsetting like this? Support, I guess, in the European context. Um, yeah, we, we, we know for, um, we have been checking with most of the funding providers, also the, the Flemish funding, the European funding, like um, what can be done with this money. And so that's why, um, we are very aware with our bookkeeping department what's happening. So if a research group is being funded from the Flemish government or, for example, from the Flemish government, we cannot put it back to the research. So that's why it's made very clear that these funding are not going to research. If the funding provider is not allowing compensation, then it's not going to the reforestation. So it's really with the bookkeeping department, it's very handled much. And I think 98% of the funding providers are in line now with the, with the policy. Fantastic. Okay, so I think it would still be lovely 
to move into the breakout rooms because we do have some new faces here and so that you get the chance to chat to each other. Um, I'm just going to pop the, um, the prompts that we wanted to give you for this discussion in the chat. Um, but yes, basically the idea is that we will be moving into the breakout rooms to discuss how you're doing this on in your various institutions, what your organization's doing, do you have policies in, in line with an overall carbon reduction strategy, and of course we're interested in hearing about any best practice. Um, so, uh, I will, please don't be afraid, um, I will launch the breakout sessions now. Um, and then we will join back right before um, before we end, just to do a quick debrief. But anybody, of course, who had to leave, don't worry about that. So you should be invited to join a group now. We're back. You're back. Hi, Sita, good how are you? Hi, Mavis. It's lovely to see you. Yes, yeah, lovely to see you again almost after a year <laughs> yeah right <laughs> i can't believe it's been a year maybe it's organized okay. climate action week a year ago i was wondering Hi. if kenny can reach out to Turing screen team that is the uk study abroad funding to talk about perhaps because at the moment, they focus on giving more money to WP students. I wonder whether we can work to put a proposal to Department of Education who administer the Turing funding to kind of then include sustainable travel as part of the consideration to give students more money if they travel green. So yeah, maybe that would be something that, but this is affecting UK only, UK student going out but I still think it's worth for us to champion this. That's a good point, B. We can certainly talk about that. B was mentioning the Turing scheme and reaching out to them because we, in the European context, tend to think a lot about the Erasmus programs and European funding. But of course, the, the UK um, has its own program now, the Turing scheme. So yeah, let's talk about that, definitely. So there I do is a mention about sustainability, but it's, it's very, very vague. In the Turing scheme, there is a mention about sustainability, but... Sweet, very vague. vague. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think maybe you can use some of Matt's kind of like policy and things to kind of like put a proposal. Yeah. Yes, I think we're all now inspired by Matt's policy and would love to nice to uh, to pick and copy bits of it for our own institutions. And I hope that you had the chance to uh, discuss that at least a little bit in the breakout rooms. Um, I'm not going to go through every breakout room and ask you to give feedback, but if anybody would like to just share with the group any in interesting discussion that you had in the breakout room, I know that's, and if you have to go, please go ahead and leave. Uh, but is anything burning that somebody would like to share with the group? We've all got sessions to go on to or days to continue with, but we'll thank you very much to everybody for being here and for joining the conversation. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you're interested in getting involved in the Canny Europe chapter or in Canny in general. Um, I'm going to pop the, just my, uh, um, the Europe email address um, in the chat, uh, but you will all know that anyway. It's the one that sends out the, uh, the invitations if you sign up. Um, so yes, thank you so much to everybody for being here and we look forward to continuing the conversation and the work that you're all doing in your institutions. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. Thank you everyone. And thank you, Matt. That was great. Really thank good. Words, thank indeed. you everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.